Uh, hello, I'm uh, Georgi Gugliashvili, co-founder and executive director of the Institute for Development of Freedom of Information, and it's my great pleasure to open our event of uh, Global Data Barometer Results for the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region. We aim to present the results of the Eastern European and Central Asian region in the Global Barometer based on uh, thematic modules, as well as prominent challenges and recommendations relevant to this region. The Global Data Barometer, GDB, is a critical new benchmark that measures the state of the data in 109 countries around the globe in terms of governance, availability, uh, capability, and use for the public good. The G GDB is a uh, collaborative project of the Data for Development Network conducted through regions, regional hubs and uh, thematic partners. The Latin American Open Data Initiative, ILDA, leads the development of the Global Data Barometer on behalf of the Data for Development Network. IDFI had the privilege to act as a regional hub for the GDB project for Central Asia and Eastern Europe, covering 12 uh, countries. So far, in particular, we have been coordinating the country assessment process in the following states, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Mongolia, Republic of Moldova, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. The global results we are published uh, in May this year, and our event is uh, aiming to discuss um, our regional, regional results with the consideration of global trends, highlight significant challenges, and design possible solutions to those shortcomings. The event is held with the support from the Latin American Open Data Initiative, ILDA, and the engagement of IDFI and national researchers from the Central Asia and Eastern Europe. In the GDB project has been also supported by the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, Regional Office for the Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and I would like to express my gratitude for this support. It is a great honor for me to have the Global Data Barometer Project Director, Ms. Silvana Fumega, as a speaker during our regional event. Thank you, dear Silvana, for being with us and for your cooperation and support. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, throughout the project implementation is much appreciated and congratulations as well for very impactful uh, results of GDB pilot project so far. We are sure that GDB results and finding will play a significant role in advancing uh, more access to open data in our region and not only but beyond in the globe. So before uh, handing over to Silvana for presenting global data barometer and some global findings, uh, I wanted to share some technical details. Uh, we have the uh, Zoom participants and uh, you can use chat to greet each other. In case there are any questions from the participants, please use question and answer uh, uh, in the Zoom and we will try to address them to the relevant speaker during the panel discussion, which we'll have late, we will have later. You are more than encouraged to ask questions and moderator will consider them, you know, of course. So now we can start with the presentation of uh, Silvana, who will overview the GDB, its structure, and share some findings from the pilot edition. Dear, dear Silvana, uh, thank you once again for, your, for being with us for this project, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation and the brief introduction to the GDB. I think I'm going to repeat some of the things that you already said, but uh, it's okay. Uh, and I'm really got, glad to be part of this conversation. I think it's going to be an important and useful conversation that we are going to have today with the national researchers, with the coordination team, and I'm really grateful for that. So just not to waste 
too much time. What I'm gonna try to do is give a, a brief introduction to what the Global Data Barometer entails. I'm gonna try to pack two years of work in 10 or 20 or 15 minutes. So uh, please bear with me as probably there are gonna be so many details that are not gonna be able to, to include in this presentation, but I'm open to any comments, any questions later when we discuss the, the results. So I'm gonna share my screen to make things easier. So I think you are all uh, seeing the screen. And um, basically what I'm, want to say is that uh, the barometer, as, as it was already mentioned, the goal of the barometer is to provide a new benchmark and the essential data needed to drive a fuller understanding of the state of data for development around the world. And it was mentioned, we have the support of IDRC, we have the support of UNFPA as well, uh, and not only that, I mean, we also have the, the, the support of the regional and thematic partners. I mean, here we are with the colleagues of IDFI. They were a key uh, part of the success of this project. I mean, you can see there are other regional partners. Uh, there were 12 uh, and also the thematic partners that I'm going to go into a little bit of more detail when I'm talking about the modules. Uh, on May 11th, uh, the GDB launched the first results of the first edition. This was the, the culmination of the efforts of over 100 researchers and a network of regional uh, hubs around the world, including, as I mentioned, IDFI. Uh, the design of the barometer builds on the previous editions of the Open Data Barometer, ODB, as uh, probably some of you already know, but takes a much broader look at data sharing and use for the public good, including additional attention to issues such as privacy and inclusion. The GDB draws on primary data from a global expert server carried out in mid-2021 uh, in 109 countries, and it was combined with secondary data from trusted sources to generate a range of metrics. The period, and I think this is important, assess is May 2019 to May 2021. So probably if you know or see other things that are uh, not in that range, they were not assessed in this edition in particular. And why we started this project? Uh, mainly because the global data agenda has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Initially, the main focus was on openness, particularly of public data, under the assumption that better open data would deliver better development outcomes. And that's the reason that the Open Data Barometer, our predecessor study, was set up in the first place. However, today we are talking and thinking much more about issues such as privacy, protection of human rights, uh, AI, digital security, inclusion, data governance within countries and across them. And all of these topics can no longer be ignored. This increased complexity of the data agenda has at best only been partially reflected in global measurements, at least until now. So in this context, the GDB has been designed to respond to these issues and to fill critical knowledge gaps on how data policy and practices are unfolding in different sectors, regions, and countries around the world. So basically, uh, this project looks at the landscape beyond just open data and through semantic lenses. Uh, they are land, political integrity, climate action, health and COVID, uh, public contracting, company information, and public finance. Some of the numbers here, uh, just to, to give you uh, a, a quick uh, look at the first edition, 109 countries, 12 regional hubs, including IDFI, as I was already mentioned, six thematic partners, 39 indicators, and more than 60,000 data points. Inside the report and the website that I'm inviting you all to, to check. You can see also information about more than 1,800 data sets, more than 900 frameworks, and more than 70 open data initiatives. And as mentioned before, uh, this project looks at data issues through four pillars. Those are data governance, capability, availability, and use and impact of data for public good. And all the indicators that I mentioned fit these four pillars via two, uh, two core modules that are governance and capability and seven semantic modules 
five of them in partnership with expert organizations. In that sense, a uh, political integrity module was developed in partnership with OCP and Transparency International, public procurement in partnership with open contracting, company information in partnership with open ownership, public finance in partnership with gifts, and land with land ports. And also we have other two modules on pressing issues such as climate action and health and COVID. Here you can see a little bit of the structure. I mean, just to give you an idea on, uh, on how complex the structure of the GDP was. And in order to gather all this data, regional partners hired national researchers who were trained according to the GDP handbook. And after the, the researchers did the fieldwork with the help of coordinators in each of the regional hubs, a review was conducted with the support also of the uh, from our thematic partners. In spite of that, responses and justifications are available on our website, as well as a feedback channel in order for you to share any comment, questions or feedbacks to help us continue to improve our work moving forward. All the data collection and review process was conducted during the second half of 2021. And some clarifications about the data. Um, the data collected allow us to show uh, how countries are performing against, against each module. However, I want to highlight that the GDP is more a rating than a ranking. Uh, the primary indicators are scored on a base of a, a zero to a hundred scale, where a hundred is designed to measure best, best practices defined against international agreed frameworks. So even though comparisons between countries can be used to look for strengths and weaknesses, we think that the greater value in this model is in showing individual areas for improvement in each country and enabling them to target and track improvements over time. Uh, one particular thing that also I want to say, because later we are going to discuss about the results of the regions, is that the barometer norms are designed to be attainable. And we did an exercise to prove that, that we take the maximum score given on each indicator and we build an imaginary country that combines the best performance found across all the countries assessing this edition, it would score 95.92. So proving that virtually all countries should be able to attain high scores with time and effort. And that's basically the purpose of the barometer, to guide that effort. I won't provide a, a breakdown of the result because I know there's going to be a conversation about the region in particular uh, after this presentation. But I, I mean, there you can see some of the general average scores uh, for all the countries, the 109 countries in the world, just to give you an idea. Uh, and again, you see numbers there, the average score between 50, 45, 27, etc. But keep in mind, First of all, these are average scores between all the countries. And second of all, uh, that uh, uh, the scores that we are building could be attainable. So there are a lot of room for improvement if we take this number into consideration. So just some general observations based on all the numbers uh, that we have in this edition. Uh, one of the things is that developing and using data for the public good is possible. Again, virtually all the norms established by the barometer are in theory attainable today. However, the scores, as, we, as I showed just a, a few minutes ago, uh, prove us that there is still a long way to go. Thinking about in particular about open data, that is, even though we look at data beyond just open data is still a key component of this measurement. So in general sense, open data agendas are alive, but they are not progressing in a linear way. So they are not increasing at the same rate that it was as they were a few years ago. So even though new national open data initiatives have launched since, for example, 2016, others have disappeared completely. However, the, the, the positive note is that in those instances where initiatives have been sustained, they are often more uh, resourced and more embedded than they were in the past. And as well, open data principles have been embedded in a number of sectorial initiatives. Another point that I'd like to make uh, is about capacity gaps. And in that sense, I'm referring to skills, training, infrastructure, 
and they remain a significant barrier to delivering value from data. So even though digital divide may be narrowing in some places, there is still a lot of gaps in government, private sector, and civil society in their ability to create and use data for public good. Another key takeaway is that well-drafted frameworks deliver better data. When rules are explicit about collection, management, and sharing, data is, is much more likely to be available, useful, and sustainable in addressing any number of issues for the public good. And lastly, one thing that I think is important and is particularly relevant uh, for this conversation is that collaboration between, for example, traditional civil society and civic technologies, or between journalists and private sector application providers are driving new uses of data that highlight, for example, corruption, promote public integrity, monitor environmental issues, or shape public policy debate. You can see some examples in our report, and also here uh, we shall speak a few of them for you to, to see. But again, I mean, all these examples are included in the report and the raw data, you can find it in our website. Uh, and also one last thing that I want to say is that there is a clear evidence that partnerships and the work of international organizations in terms of advocacy of certain topics, for example, your you're going to see that some of the topics uh, that are scoring better uh, across the globe are related to procurement and fin finance. So in that sense, uh, these results are showing that the work of these organizations are uh, improving the, the agenda, the data agenda. So I'm going to stop here because I don't want to take all the time and um, I want our colleagues uh, there to, to talk about the, the regional findings. But before that, I want to invite everybody to check the results and the reports uh, also with the analysis from IDFI included in our report and also all the data that you can see from the various countries that are including in the region. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm open to any comments or questions that come up during the conversation. Thank you again. Thank you, dear Solana, very much for, for this insightful presentation about GDB and sharing the global findings. So after we have an understanding of the GDB structure and global findings, we have the opportunity to better focus on our region. And uh, Tiona Turashvili from IDFI, she's the head of the Internet Inno Innovations Direction uh, at the organization. She will present the major tendencies and needs for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So please Tiona, take the lead and uh, present and share the, the findings as well as the details of the study. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Georgi and uh, Silvana, uh, for your opening remarks. And also, uh, Silvana already somehow overviewed made major structure and major some kind of tendencies um, regard, um, regarding access to open data uh, at the global level. And I would highlight here that um, uh, some of the tendencies which were observed uh, at the global level it was relevant for our region as well. Uh, so, and now I will um, share my uh, slides uh, and start with our region. Uh, so, as for um, major some kind of tendencies, um, now I, it's better, yes. Um, so to look at the uh, data, actually, our uh, overall score for our region was um, uh, 33, uh, about 33. And as Silvana already mentioned, there is huge some kind of potential for improvement in the future. And this score is also obvious for the region. Uh, and if we look at global scores, our region uh, scores margin are marginally below the global average on the capacity capabilities. Uh, so, which means that we have a lot uh, to do in this direction, as I remember from uh, Silvana's presentation uh, on the global level, this capability score was uh, 50, and we have uh, about uh, uh, 
36 in our region. So in this, uh, not 37. Uh, yeah, so it, it means that we have lots of, a lot to do in this direction. Uh, and in case of uh, use and impact, actually, even though we see, we think that our region has uh, somehow quite low scores in this direction, which is about uh, 38 uh, in use, uh, impact and use. But in, if you look at global scores, actually, uh, our scores are a little bit marginally above the global score. Uh, so which, meant, uh, which, uh, which reflects actually the civil society le uh, led use cases of data, which of course is very interesting, but we, th we think that other stakeholders should be also engaged in this process. And in general, actually, uh, our scores demonstrate that uh, there is need for strengthening data governance in our region and adopting more uh, multi-stakeholder approaches to promote data management, availability and use of data for public good. And these are the major some kind of uh, tendencies and uh, what we see in the region. But as for some kind of particular scores, now I will uh, go deeper into the country results. And uh, here in this slide, you will see results for particular countries according to the whole overall scores because it has a special formula. And uh, if you dig deeper into the methodology, you will understand there's their special formula, which somehow um, calculate this course for particular indicators and particular countries. And Ukraine had the high scores in the region. Uh, and afterwards comes Armenia, Kazakhstan, Moldova, Georgia. And as for some kind of countries with um, the lowest scores, we have Turkmenistan and Tajikistan. Uh, and um, if, you, if you look at uh, these key, four key indicators, uh, which are accessibility capabilities, data governance, and use and impact. Ukraine was uh, the country which was leading in most of these indicators, uh, uh, and Armenia had quite a, a high score uh, in case of a, a, a accessibility of data. Uh, um, but in general, and also I would highlight here Ukraine's case, which was quite exceptional in case of use and impact, which demonstrates that they have very interesting data initiatives uh, coming from different stakeholders, especially from civil society and media organizations. And it could be some kind of inspiration for other countries as well. And I'm, now I will go uh, through major some kind of tendencies what we highlighted. First of all, it's about use and impact. Impact was a category what I already highlighted that it, it, it was a major, major some kind of challenging uh, component for the region, which means that even though we have very interesting initiatives and use cases um, of uh, data for public good from the side of civil society and pa partially from media as well, but we see that uh, uh, there is need uh, for engagement of public sector and academia in this uh, regard, and they should also start using data for creating new services, new applications, and even every uh, database, some kind of uh, studies from the side, side of um, uh, academia, especially. And we see, we also think that, uh, I mean, maybe it's some kind of our reflection as well from Georgian experience that um, uh, even though data is very important for civil society organizations to oversee government, uh, but we think that a uh, public, se uh, um, uh, private sector also should start using data for creating new services. So to create some kind of economic benefits out of data, and it also somehow uh, improves uh, uh, this our discussion about the use of data for for public good in general. Um, and another some kind of tendency is that even though uh, in our region there are several countries where we, we, we know that data is very effective to, for uh, civil society organizations to oversee the government and uh, track uh, uh, public money, for example, but uh, still some countries uh, lack uh, tools for uh, public oversight of officials. And especially we think that some uh, uh, government is not uh, some uh, governments are not open for some kind of 
public participation and decision-making process to use data uh, in this process as well. Uh, and actually, we also had this component of um, whether public consult consultations we are held, whether governments had some kind of legislation in this regard, and whether these uh, results out of these public consultations we are available afterwards, and uh, major countries had problems in these directions. As a positive development, we saw that um, out of these data indicators, procurement data was the most available in the region, um, which means that uh, even, uh, for example, nowadays, this is a tendency that uh, open contracting data standards are also implemented in uh, most of the countries. Uh, but on the other hand, in contrast, we see that this lobbying data seems to be the most challenging and uh, most of the countries lack even some kind of framework, le legislative frameworks regarding um, uh, how to uh, somehow collect this data and afterwards how to uh, publish this uh, data. And of course, in case they have some kind of legislation, uh, how to uh, uh, how to collect data on lobbyism, uh, they don't publish this data and the public uh, don't have access to uh, such kind of data. Um, and, of, uh, and also uh, regarding healthcare data, because of the existing uh, global challenge such as COVID pandemic, of course, GDB considered this issue and uh, we had this opportunity to observe to what extent COVID related data was publicly available. And in the doubt that this country, even though most of the countries actually have been publishing some kind of statistics uh, on COVID pa uh, pandemic, but uh, they lacked uh, disaggregated vaccination data, uh, which would enable us to somehow have better understanding about uh, healthcare tendencies in these directions. And also, uh, even in, in the cases when they have been published, uh, this data was not in open formats, and of course, it, it complicated um, somehow uh, opportunities for us to uh, process this data very easily. Uh, based on these challenges, we have identified also needs what should be done in the long run. I would say that these needs are the most important ones. Uh, and uh, later, when we have this uh, discussion on particular countries, we will focus on uh, the, uh, I mean, local context, uh, and uh, we will have more opportunities to have more insights from national researchers and uh, uh, country-specific needs. But I will highlight the needs which applies to most of the countries in our region. Uh, first of all, it's about the need for solid regulatory frameworks on access to data, which means that uh, these countries countries uh, need some kind of uh, standards on open data uh, and also to have some uh, requirements regarding da uh, data sharing regulations within the country among uh, public institutions. Uh, and uh, so these are, uh, and, um, and of, of course, in this case, there is need for political will because if the countries don't have some kind of political will, it's very uh, difficult to have common standards on open data. Um, and the second, some kind of uh, needs from our side, it's about capacity building and it's, uh, it was, uh, as it was shown before, uh, this region lacks some kind of uh, capacity building. Uh, um, so it has somehow low, lowest scores compared to uh, the global tendencies in capacity building, which means that we need more some kind of trainings for, especially for civil servants, because they are the ones who are generating and publishing data. And we are, when we are talking about capacity building, of course, it, it applies and it covers issue, issues such as uh, data collection, data processing, uh, uh, publication of data, uh, data and use of uh, open data. Um, and of course, apart from public servants, we would highlight here the importance of um, enhancing skills of data use among uh, um, uh, civil society organizations, media, uh, 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 private sector, and academia as well. 
Um, and this third uh, direction, we think that apart from capacity building, we think that in order to have more some kind of uh, imp uh, impactful and uh, very influential some kind of use cases of data for um, public good, we need some kind of multi-stakeholder uh, and multi-sectoral uh, cooperation uh, in order to have some kind of more interesting, innovative, uh, data-driven initiatives and projects uh, at the local level. And maybe it could be even on regional level as well. But since we perform low in terms of um, use and impact, it, it means that even though sometimes data is available, we need more some kind of incentives and motivations to different stakeholders in order to cooperate with each other, share experience. Maybe they have the different background, but they could have some kind of joint uh, projects from Common Cause. So this will be my some kind of final reflection. Uh, and. Um, we now uh, can switch to this, uh, we have this opportunity actually uh, to discuss uh, country specific uh, problems and challenges later. Uh, and um, if I may now, uh, I will ask our uh, panelists um, to join us, I mean country researchers. Uh, from uh, different countries, you can switch on camera and we can start uh, discussion and we can go to the another panel. Mm, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us for today's discussion. Uh, and uh, so I already overviewed some kind of major results for the uh, for our uh, region and now we will, now we will have the opportunity to hear some kind of uh, major findings and uh, challenges and also some kind of uh, opportunities uh, for particular countries uh, and uh, so now we, we can start with uh, Arbine if I may and Arbine is uh, uh, from Armenia and uh, she will represent uh, present Armenia's results uh, in GDP floor is yours, dear Bine. Thank you, Teona. Thank you for introductions and hello, everyone. Uh, let me share with you the presentation. Um, uh -huh. uh, hopefully you can see this. Um, so I'll uh, briefly introduce to you the results from uh, Armenia, and I'll focus mostly on the strengths and weaknesses, so we can discuss what are the areas for improvement and what, what are the strengths that can be used by other countries. Um, first of all, some uh, generic overview of, of the country results. Um, Armenia has scored uh, 45, 45 points, uh, which uh, which is uh, higher than the global average, and global average is uh, 34 points. Uh, this brings Armenia to the second uh, position in the regional uh, ranking. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see the overall distribution of the scores uh, for Armenia, and as you can see, public procurement and public finance uh, areas are the main areas where um, uh, Armenia has a better position compared to, um, among other modules, I mean. Uh, talking about the comparison with uh, other countries in the region, if we talk about the achievements that uh, Armenia has uh, in comparison, and uh, it can uh, serve as a um, basis for um, maybe cooperation and um, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, I'd like to talk about the modules where uh, Armenia ranked uh, uh, from first to third uh, positions, so political integrity, public finance, and climate action our modules where uh, Armenia is leading uh, in the region. For political uh, integrity, <clears throat> what contributed to this module is, the um, first of all, uh, the existence of the declaration registry. It is a requirement from the government for uh, high-ranking uh, public officials and also people who are affiliated um, uh, to them to share their uh, property and uh, income declarations publicly. Um, and this information is not uh, only used by the government, but uh, is actively used by, uh, by media and some investigative uh, media 
agencies um, even uh, have developed more uh, advanced tools to uh, generate uh, analyses and reports uh, and to dig more into this uh, declaration. Um, the second uh, module uh, is public uh, finance. Here, um, Ministry of Finance is sharing standardized, uh, standardized uh, templates uh, with um, the state uh, agencies uh, and communities and regional governments where they input their expenses and um, overall budget structure. And um, it is available on government websites as an uh, interactive budget. And here you can see the small screenshot of this interactive uh, visualized budget. Besides this visualization, uh, the users also have an opportunity to uh, export the data uh, in forms of uh, tables. Uh, structured uh, tables and uh, this data is uh, machine readable. So this complies to the requirements of uh, open data and open data standards. Uh, as for climate action, um, so the Ministry of Environment uh, yeah, had, uh, is submitting annual reports where it is uh, specifying um, projections, vulnerability assessment um, and other indicators on climate, uh, climate change, uh, which um, comply to the uh, to the requirements of international organizations however i should mention that here although armenia is ranking uh, the first in the region uh, there is a lot of room for imp improvement because this information uh, is uh, available but uh, not in machine readable uh, format those are just uh, reports that are uh, published in uh, pdf format so you can't see the you can't analyze the, the historic data and you, you you cannot um do a lot of analysis with that um, uh, in this area, it is worth men mentioning also the availability of uh, red book uh, data. Um, it is not only available of the website, uh, on the website of the uh, Ministry of the Environment, but also um, there is a mobile app where um, you can explore uh, based uh, within, uh, and it, it comes with an interactive map, so you can explore uh, within a specific area uh, and read more about the endangered species, of both plants and uh, animals. Um, uh, some other uh, areas that maybe um, might be interesting for other countries and uh, can be a good example um, are um, health and COVID-19, um, uh, data on health and COVID-19, particularly on civil registration and vital statistics. Uh, so this uh, data in Armenia is uh, fully digitized and uh, state agency, agencies uh, have this interoperability where they can um, interchange uh, um, uh, data on, on civil acts. Uh, although I should mention that this data is not publicly uh, available and is also available to the state agencies. Um, governance, uh, governance and public procurement are two other um, areas. Um, public procurement, uh, a good example is a platform that uh, the screenshot you can see on your screen. Um, here um, are maps, uh, which is a platform um, guided by the Minister of Finance. Um, uh, the users can see uh, how the public procurement processes are taking place in Armenia. Here are the full reports of um, of the contractors, their contracts, and you can uh, export uh, detailed reports uh, on this. Uh, now about some uh, areas that uh, need uh, improvement. Um, and as uh, Silvana mentioned during her speech, uh, this is a good opportunity. The, the value of uh, the global data barometer is that uh, it, it is pinpointing to the individual areas that need improvement. So here we can see the areas uh, and the results uh, clearly show what uh, the areas are for Armenia to be improved. Capabilities, uh, land data, and company information are the um, three uh, modules, three areas that we are a little behind. Uh, if we speak about the overall challenges, uh, and it is across the modules, both core and thematic modules, uh, what we need to do is uh, we lack a low a policy on uh, open data. Uh, although we have a digitalization strategy, which is highlighting the importance of having the open data policy. However, it is not developed and it is not approved yet. Uh, we don't have very explicit open data initiatives, uh, although we are part of uh, OGP um, and there are some commitments 
uh, for open data uh, for open data initi uh, initiatives. So it is in the process, but um, uh, for the reporting period, there, there weren't any tangible outcomes yet. Uh, we have some data management and data sharing frameworks in place. However, uh, they come with some shortages, so we need to work uh, on their improvement. Um, another issue, which is, um, I guess, very prevalent in the, uh, in the region, and uh, Tiona mentioned uh, about this, uh, sometimes there is information, there is data, but it, not always it complies to open data standards. Uh, and in the end, uh, Armenia lacks uh, some uh, subnational uh, capabilities, uh, meaning that uh, mostly the policies, initiatives uh, are at the national level or at least at the level of the capital, but uh, there is very little evidence um, at the regional or community level. Thank you. I think this much about Armenia. Uh, thank you, uh, Arpine. I think you've highlighted very interesting points, and I'm sure that we will have the opportunity to discuss these issues uh, later uh, when we have this open some kind of questions and answers um, part of our uh, discussion. And uh, I'm sure that some of the points are also relevant for other countries. Uh, so now uh, I, I think I'm inviting David uh, from Georgia and uh, he will uh, uh, present the results for uh, Georgia and major challenges and needs as well. Yes, David, floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, let me share my presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I uh, hope everyone can uh, see the presentation. Um, well, I prepared this um, uh, format in a very similar manner. I will overview some, uh, some main challenges that we uncovered in Georgia throughout the research process, as well as some of the good practice and good results that uh, we were able to, uh, to identify in the country. Um, the overall score was uh, 40.25 for uh, the country of Georgia, uh, which ranks uh, number uh, four in the region. And uh, I understand that this is not the main focus of GDB to rank the countries, but uh, I believe that this still provides some perspective as to uh, where uh, Georgia stands in the region in terms of uh, the studied topics. Um, the main challenges and gaps that were identified, first of all, uh, we have to start with uh, the lack of regulatory framework in terms of open data. Um, the, um, the, there is requirements to publish data from the side of the government, but uh, there is very uh, seldom and sporadic use of uh, actual open data standards, which greatly uh, reduces the quality and uh, the accessibility of data being processed and published by uh, the public sector. Um, something that derives from that is also the uh, issues with the government open data portal, which has been uh, mostly ignored and inactive for the past few years. Uh, it is in uh, dire need of being um, being updated uh, and being um, serviced with additional data sets and uh, ad additional uh, IT support. Um, also, the, the capacity to manage data at the local level is, uh, is a great challenge at the moment, uh, since most of the data management and data processing takes place at the central level and um, the municipality of Georgia are mostly uh, ignorant of this process or lack the resources and capacity to uh, meaningfully engage in uh, open data generation and, uh, uh, and uh, processing. Um, uh, another challenge that was very apparent was the lack of mechanisms for processing public consultation data. This is firstly because there is very um, very dire um, uh, mechanisms for uh, public engagement in general uh, in the decision-making process. So uh, therefore, uh, there is a lack of uh, uh, tools to um, produce and monitor data in that regard. 
Uh, also, despite the availability of uh, company data, um, the regulatory framework for beneficial ownership is still um, uh, very young in Georgia. It needs uh, more specificity. It needs more. Um, um, it needs more details to be uh, to be added, and um, the data for beneficial owners need to be more available, uh, at, at least to the same level as uh, as uh, basic company data that is uh, being published pretty regularly on uh, government websites. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the main gaps that uh, I would like to mention is the lack of uh, data on climate vulnerabilities, which is a component of the climate action module. And it implies um, uh, the availability of data on weather uh, conditions and um, uh, other, uh, other uh, weather, uh, weather hazards, as well as uh, vulnerable populations and, uh, um, uh, and, and other emergency um, uh, conditions. Uh, this data is not being collected or processed in Georgia at this uh, moment, uh, which which seriously affected the um, uh, the results of Georgia in this module. Uh, to move on to some of the uh, good uh, practice and some of the achievements uh, that we found out uh, in Georgia was the uh, first of all uh, the good availability of land data, which is mostly due to a uh, well-run cadastre system. Um, the only challenges in this regard was uh, the existence of fees imposed for full access on, on land data. Uh, this, of course, is a serious uh, barrier in terms of uh, accessibility to open land data. Uh, one of the uh, fr front runners uh, in transparency of political party financing um, the data turned out to be Georgia, and um, uh, this uh, data is not only available, but also um, there is pretty good uh, evidence of, of its use and impact in the country, since um, most, uh, most NGOs working in this uh, sector are, uh, are using public uh, political financing data to uh, in their research and in their uh, watchdog activities. Um, public procurement data for uh, the next point uh, is um, well available, which is a tendency that is common in the region. Uh, for most countries, public procurement data and public procurement uh, portals are uh, well run, reasonably well run, even though OCBS uh, standards are uh, not used as frequently as in other parts of the world. Uh, and finally, public finance data in this regard, I would, uh, in, in this regard, Georgia scored pretty high compared to other uh, modules. Uh, I would only mention two main uh, challenges, which is um, the uh, structure of the data uh, that's available and um, the, uh, the openness of the data, which uh, still lacks uh, in several, several aspects. Uh, of course, these are not the only challenges and the only achievements that uh, we highlighted in the, through this research, but uh, a more comprehensive picture can be accessed through the, um, the GDB's report, as well as the report, uh, the regional report that uh, IDFI published on our website. And uh, I believe these, both of these documents are linked in the chat. Uh, this will be all for my presentation. And uh, uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm sure that we will somehow discuss some of the issues uh, deeply later. Uh, but we, uh, before um, we move to uh, our another uh, panelist today, I, I just wanted to encourage our uh, participants, if you have any questions actually even to particular countries, just use uh, our Q&A uh, section and uh, you can submit your questions and I will raise these questions afterwards. But uh, you will have opportunity also to comment on particular, uh, some kind of reflections made by our panelists later when we have this uh, um, open um, 
uh, discussion. Uh, and with this, I would love to ask Iqbal Safarov to intervene and uh, he will uh, present uh, results for Azerbaijan. Dear Iqbal, floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. I guess, yeah, now I can share my screen. Probably you already see my screen. Uh, yes, yes. In, in Azerbaijan, the results are significantly below than the average. So uh, you can see main drivers of uh, a little bit below score is related to the land data, company information data, and many other components. So basically, uh, these results have a lot of components that impact with the uh, below uh, score of the country. I think uh, it's important to uh, highlight this result with the shade of capabilities of the country because capabilities can explain why uh, Azerbaijan has significantly below results. I want to highlight three elements in capability, which is digital skills, uh, use of digital tools and internet access. Those three elements are critical for open data in any way, in any country, uh, Azerbaijan as well. As you see, the result is quite good in terms of infrastructure and having digital technologies, but those elements didn't impact to open data performance. Uh, what I also want to highlight uh, in terms of the progress of open data initiatives is uh, Considering 2017 and 2018, the results of open data initiatives didn't progress. So many of the initiatives started during 2017 and 2018, and then it stopped. Uh, pretty much this is uh, uh, overall landscape in the country, and this can explain uh, why Azerbaijan has significantly below results comparing to other countries. Uh, in this picture, uh, we can identify four significant challenges that explains this result. And one important element is e-government development because e-government de development highlights uh, the importance and uh, progress of digital technologies in a country. And in Azerbaijan, we see that. And uh, however, this e-government development index is more about top-down initiative and open data initiatives are more about bottom-up initiatives. So there is mismatch between technological infrastructure layer of the uh, digital technologies and open data initiatives. This is one very important uh, takeaway. And second is uh, there is lack of systematic and or organizational support. As I mentioned, uh, two, three years ago, there were some initiatives and it was about uh, building a centralized data portal, building specialized open data portal, or implementing procurement uh, uh, services, e-procurement services. But later on, we, we see that those initiatives didn't contribute to the development of open data. Uh, in the centralized open data portal, many data sets has been listed, uh, and then it has not been updated or uh, revised, so which is, uh, related to the organizational support issue. So uh, another element is a lack of regulatory foundation. This is related to uh, also connected with the uh, lack of systematic and organizational support, because uh, if there is no good regulatory foundation, the sustainability of open data projects are under question. Uh, we need to have very good regulator foundation to have sustainable open data initiatives. Uh, when you check open data portals or initiatives of Azerbaijan, you can see that many of the data sets has been listed a long time ago and has not been revised. Furthermore, there is no organization that supports or maintains that data sets that potential data users can go them to, uh, to get updated. 
So this element is related to a uh, good level of regulatory foundation. And the last one is uh, unmature open data communities. In many cases, many Western countries, what we see that there are quite good, uh, strong open data communities. Those communities are always initiate new open data projects and initiatives that also supports government or gets uh, these kind of communities to work with open data uh, resources and get some business benefits, impact, societal impact that helps uh, communities and government organizations to promote open data initiatives. However, in Azerbaijan, we see that there is no uh, significant open data community. And this uh, lacking point also reduces the bottom up pressure that uh, no government organization feel that pressure that we need to release data. Why it is uh, possible? Because as e government uh, services are being better and better, the government organizations collect data even cheaper and easier to share such kind of data sets. However, the, if there is no need from the society, they typically do not uh, initiate it by themselves. Either it is uh, some episodic elements like a hackathon organized by a certain government organization and then during the hackathon, they release some data. There are such examples in the country. However, later on, we don't see that there is new additions of that data elements. So this uh, picture can uh, define the country's situation, uh, but there is a significant hope because uh, as digital landscape become more and more evolved and modern, then uh, we can expect that open data wouldn't be too much work for government. This is only about political uh, will of the organizations that supporting open data initiatives and opening more da open data. So for long term, I guess uh, with a little bit uh, pressure to the government organizations and building right regulator foundation, the country can catch up with other region countries and get a little bit better scores. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Iqbal. I, I think that uh, some of the points, of course, are relevant for other countries as well, but um, you uh, also highlighted uh, some of the aspects which are very much somehow uh, connected with Azerbaijan. But yeah, so we can discuss uh, these issues later. Um, uh, and uh, with this, I would, uh, I would uh, ask Rustam Mohamedov from Turkmenistan. So he represents Turkmenistan and he assessed uh, Turkmenistan in uh, GDP. Uh, and he will present major some kind of challenges and also some of the positive trends as well if we have in Turkmenistan. Floor is yours, uh, Rustam. Thank you, Tewana, for introduction. I hope everyone hears me well. Uh, good evening, everyone. It yes, is my pleasure. Um, it is my pleasure and privilege uh, to present findings on Turkmenistan for the first issue of GDB. Um, so my presentation may be going to be a little different in that it's going to focus more on the challenges and gaps. And I think this is the result of the country's course and the country's overall uh, performance uh, when it comes to GDB indicators. So Turkmenistan scored the lowest when it comes to the region with a total points of six across all the indicators. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it is the only country in the region that also scored zero when it comes to availability of open data, uh, meaning that even though the country got some points when it comes to capabilities and the governance, but then we don't see how those um, capabilities or frameworks result um, in a sort of um, data that is openly, publicly um, accessible and available across all the indicators, um, including when it comes to climate, health, uh, public finances, uh, political integrity, and etc. Basically, um, all the indicators um, that we have analyzed, that I have looked at and analyzed, there is a complete lack of um, machine readable, um, open uh, format data accessible for um, the people. Um, so with that, um, 
in general, I want to say that um, this in general reflects um, the trend Turkmenistan is basically well known that it's one of the most closed and um, isolated political entities in the world. In 2020, UN Women, for instance, um, identified that only 20.6 um, indicators uh, which are necessary, 20.6% uh, of all the indicators necessary to evaluate SDG goals from a gender perspective were available for Turkmenistan, which means there is a lack of open data information when it comes to margin, marginalized and vulnerable groups. And in general, the, um, the government is well known. This is known in academia, um, among the foreign partners, uh, international organizations and think tanks, um, including human rights watchdogs, um, that the country, that the government performs very poorly um, uh, when it comes to providing data on many crucial and important areas. Uh, with that, I'm moving to the main challenges. From, if we look overall, I think one of the main challenges is the political environment overall. If we look at the open data indicators, then of course there is a lack of regulatory environment. Um, in general, there is a lack of a uniform policy approach, so to say. Um, open data policy is not among the priorities for the government in general to sort of establish and develop. And um, what I have also analyzed and observed that the existing frameworks, such as when it comes to protection of personal data online, uh, they fall very short of uh, meeting best practices, uh, best available practices, and um, international standards and international benchmarks, um, as well as we see a lack of multi-stakeholder and multi-sector um, approaches, limited in, um, engagement from uh, various non-state um, actors as well, and lack of and very impaired capabilities at the subnational level. So in a sense, this um, also reflects what um, Iqbal was just uh, mentioning in Turkmenistan. We also observe this kind of a top-down approach when it comes to not specifically open data policies, but digitalization overall. It um, heavily focuses on developing the state infrastructure, such as developing interagency data sharing platforms and frameworks. But when it comes to engaging different other actors besides the state, then the government uh, falls short. Um, as well as um, when it comes to like public finances, public procurement, and all the relevant indicators, we see that, um, and this is also reflects what ID, uh, IDFI identified for the region, for some of the countries, that there are very limited tools for public oversight of officials and governance processes. This is particularly an acute problem for Turkmenistan, the very few activists from the exile who have focused on these topics, they're usually intimidated and harassed in very different ways. Um, so we see very limited engagement and very limited use of data, and as well as we see lack of conditions for any meaningful sociopolitical engagement. So as we see, there are more challenges and gaps, um, but there are still very humble, positive developments as well. And we really hope that by using um, the GDP results, uh, the government and various stakeholders can also sort of look at all these positives and, and all these challenges and gaps and improve the situation in the country. So on the positive, we see that there is some training when it comes to public servants, civil servants um, at different levels when it comes to improving their digital practices overall. Um, as well as we see the development of online services and e-government platforms, there are still not that many services available online and they have a lot of bugs and a lot of problems, but at least there is a movement in the right direction. Um, and on that note as well, um, in general, the development of knowledge-based economy, focus on digitalization and um, innovation, innovative technologies is one of the priorities of the government. They just need um, sort of to do it right. They are moving in the right direction, but the pace and the quality um, and the fact that they engage in a very limited way with different kinds of stakeholders and do not sort of provide the space uh, to learn and adopt the best practices. These are one of the major impediments on the road to progress. Uh, with that, I will finish up. Uh, if there are any questions, we'll be very glad to answer them. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. 
Uh, thank you, Rustam. I, I think that your presentation is a very good demonstration that, for example, when we are talking about this open data for public goods, so uh, the accessibility of particular data is not enough and uh, the activities from the government is not enough and we need some kind of other stakeholders as well you know, the, to have good performance in this. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I'm sure that we will have opportunity to discuss uh, some of the points you highlighted during your presentation. And I will now invite Huriat uh, Hudugulova, I, I hope I pronounced the name uh, correctly, and uh, she will present uh, uh, results for, for Uzbekistan. Huriat, uh, floor is yours. I think we don't hear you. Uh, you have to turn off, on come, uh, your mic. Hello, everyone. Now we I hear you. Is, yeah, I hope there is no any technical problem. Yes, presentation you can start. Yeah. Um. First of all, I want to say uh, I'm so glad to face to face to, to meet with such a point, uh, founders and coordinators. And uh, I want to say thanks for the really great works because um, the results obtained from the GDP will have to understand the real nature of important problems in, in the countries not only for Uzbekistan, for other also, such as development of the lake and emerging corruption. Um, especially using this opportunity, I want to share the main results obtained the global data barometer from the Republic of Uzbekistan. According to the overall results, according to the overall results of the um, global data barometer, Uzbekistan ranks 80, 58 out of the 109 counties with the 32 points. Uh, I, I just they would state that the rank is not important global data barometer, but I want to show the place of Uzbekistan in the world. In the case of Uzbekistan, the high scores we are estimated, uh, estimated and thematic models such as public finance and government, as well as the lowest points are expressed in the thematic models on the political integrity and company information. The reason for this is the lack of information or the existence of legislative, legislative acts for some important indicators. The Uzbek, uh, for the Uzbekistan, the results were really interesting and very really actual at the time because the main challenges and gaps is for Uzbekistan is very um, uh, really important indicators, which is the main cause for corruption. For example, uh, lack of regulatory framework around access declaration, lobbying register, and um, sorry lobbying register and beneficial ownership, lack of information on political integrity, interoperability, no evidence of accountability uses of political integrity, lack of data on political finance, uh, RTI performance data, company register, climate vulnerabilities, real-time healthcare system capacity, and light channel. Along with the challenges of this country, it was found that it is also some, uh, also uh, has some worthy good practice and achievements. In the core models government color, Uzbekistan ranks 19th in the world with uh, 52 points. Uzbekistan scores 80 points in the indicator initiative of open data, which is uh, included in the core model capability and ranks 80th in the world. The significance of the obtained result is that we have to realize the problems that arise the country, and uh, this is lagging behind in development and the environment for the development of corruption. 
that's it for now. And uh, we, uh, I have also some number of sound recommendations and other information on how to improve this country's GDP score. And I can present it to these letters through the separate references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Huriyat. Uh, yes, I'm sure you will have. Uh, I, yes, you will have the opportunity to present recommendations as well. And now I think since we have uh, all made you some kind of presentations from our country researchers, I uh, I'm inviting all of you for our some kind of a discussion. And um, so, and the uh, one of the issues actually was highlighted was about some kind of uh, what could be done uh, as a next stages. Um, and in this case, I will have uh, this question to all our some kind of uh, presenters uh, as some kind of national researchers. How do you think, uh, how, uh, what kind of recommendations you will, you will have for, uh, it could be for uh, public sector representatives or it could be for uh, media organizations or civil society organizations and, and private sector as well. What issues are priority for your particular countries uh, based on these results? And uh, apart from the some kind of thematic uh, areas, how can we achieve this? For example, how to start this some kind of improvements? Should we focus on legislation or uh, should we focus on capacity building? What are your some kind of recommendations and uh, areas we should focus on? So um, maybe Arpine, since your camera is on, you can start with your some kind of reflections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, for yeah, the recommendations. Uh, can sorry, Julia, Arpine will start and afterwards you can comment. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if I start, so uh, it's quite a multi layered uh, issue and it's uh, difficult to say how to start. But I think probably uh, it will be easier to, to start from, from policies and have binding policies that will pay close attention to open data. Uh, because sometimes, uh, and the example of our countries showed that. Uh, there are big policies, but uh, they are not followed by action plans and decrees that um, request uh, actions, or uh, there are strategies which uh, do not have uh, measurable indicators. Uh, so I guess, first of all, uh, it will be useful if governments uh, pay attention uh, to the policies and have the policies uh, at, at place uh, first. Uh, and uh, I think this exercise uh, was a great one to flag the priorities uh, because it can, in a standardized way, uh, there, is, there is an evidence, uh, it is ev evidence-based uh, issues that we need to uh, work on. Um, so I guess it's a good roadmap for, uh, uh, for the governments to, uh, to make follow-up actions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And Iqbal, maybe you would love to intervene. I guess uh, other than policy, of course, policies are quite important to start any kind of activities, not only about open data. It's important uh, in this stage of open data maturity in the world, it's important to start a little bit small because uh, starting from 2012 uh, or later, a little bit earlier in different countries, open data initiatives targeted to open as much as uh, possible data sets. However, many of them have not been used or it's not useful, there is no community, there is no demand from society to get something with that data. Uh, but other data sets are quite critical like contracting data, financial data, budgeting data. So it seems that for countries like Azerbaijan or other Central Asian or Eastern European countries that do not have good maturity, it would be better to start a little bit small and target the significant data that can create impact. Because uh, open data in this maturity level needs to have good story to, to share with the community and to show the importance of it. And probably we, uh, many of the cases, we fail to find that important story to deliver to the society.
Uh, thank you, Iqbal. I think uh, this some kind of focus on particular areas is, is a very strategic de decision to some extent, and it's very interesting because sometimes we have we use the same strategy in Georgia as well, because IDFI is a um, uh, Tbilisi based on governmental organization which uh, works on and advocates more access to public data over the past years and actually we use this strategy and it's not somehow relevant for particular countries. And uh, maybe David also wanted to uh, share some thoughts on this about next steps. Uh, well, um, for, for Georgia, uh, the next steps would uh, uh, definitely have to do with improving uh, the regulatory framework, first of all, uh, because this, uh, it, this has been the main challenge uh, in terms of uh, our scores. And, uh, um, and it uh, has to be the first step in order to improve all the other uh, areas. Um, also, I would uh, like to uh, answer one uh, question that was posed in the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, it was answered with a link, but uh, I can provide some brief details. So um, Nana asked uh, if we could talk more about what climate vulnerability data is and how uh, what how specifically it could be more available in Georgia. Um, so climate vulnerability data is an indicator uh, that is included in the climate action module of GDB. And it uh, uh, basically implies the, uh, uh, the data about uh, natural hazards, for example, uh, landslides or uh, extreme weather events uh, such as hailstorms and the uh, likelihood of uh, them happening in specific uh, areas and regions. So in Georgia for, uh, for now, this data is not being uh, updated. Historical data is not available and uh, to our knowledge, it's not being collected at this time. Um, well, and uh, um, implementing measures and uh, uh, maybe surveying some good practices from other countries where this data is available would be a first step in improving this, uh, this indicator. Uh, thank you, David. And also, I would here raise uh, this some kind of comment made by Silvana in the chat about this published with a purpose, actually referring to Iqbal's comment, uh, which is which uh, comes from Open Data Charter. And this idea means that even, uh, for example, if previously uh, open data advocates have been focusing on access to public data in general, now the uh, somehow focus is uh, made on demand. So uh, you should publish, first of all, those data which are somehow requested from the society. So, and actually, and this point uh, could be considered by us as well when we plan in particular advocacy uh, activities in our countries. And thank you, Silvana, for uh, mentioning this. And uh, now I will ask Rustam, and uh, maybe he has some uh, reflections to share on uh, some kind of future steps which could be implemented by different stakeholders in Turkmenistan. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple of thoughts. Um, overall, yes, I agree. Particularly when it comes to Turkmenistan, we see an acute lack of like evidence-based and data-driven researchers and studies. There is complete lack of any information. And it's very difficult to sort of um, suggest which way um, it would be to go because um, considering the country's political environment the government is unwilling to share certain information that it considers to be too sensitive in a sense that it um, sort of undermines the positive image of the country that the authorities try to build um, i would totally agree that we need to sort of tackle these kind of issues across different fronts so the um, developing a proper policy frameworks is very important regulatory frameworks um, as well as developing the capabilities is also one of those important things because 
digital divide, digital literacy, low digital literacy, um, very important um, issues and undermining factors when it comes to Turkmenistan, uh, particularly. So in that sense, I would say even, um, like I think Iqbal was mentioning it, um, even some baby steps or small steps, but taken in the right direction, including through the involvement of um, foreign partners and uh, international agencies, including like UN agencies, et cetera. Um, that would be uh, much better than sort of um, expecting some radical changes happening all at once in Turkmenistan's political environment. Particularly when we look um, at Turkmenistan, sometimes we have a well-developed policy frameworks that sometimes even meet international standards, such as our law on mass media, but then the reality on the ground is uh, completely opposite and different. Um, so, and there is this great mismatch. So even sort of bringing these things together um, also would be something great. I mean, even if there are no immediate um, and radical breakthroughs, but um, as I mentioned previously, even some smaller steps, but in the right directions uh, would be something uh, hugely positive. And in that way, we can start with the information um, that the government may not consider as sensitive, such as land information, certain um, topics when it comes to climate vulnerability issues, for instance, well, that would be sort of a good way to start. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Rustam. And maybe Juliet also would love to share some thoughts. Yes, I have some recommendations. Uh, in case of Uzbekistan, uh, the line between politics and business remains blurry. That's why I have some recommendations, um, the priority recommendations. First of all, to ensure the to ensure that the leg legislative acts for the formation of information about the asset declaration, the lobbying register, and uh, beneficial ownership, and to be provided their publication as open information. Second one, to ensure the openness of political finance information, that is information about the financial situation of political parties and political companies, including their income, assets, and liability. Uh, ter third one, to ensure the openness of information about companies registered um, in this country and the national register of companies. Uh, for example, uh, Uzbekistan score score and this thematic model uh, such as uh, company information is zero. Uh, it doesn't mean there is no information. Information is exists, but it is not uh, public or open. Uh, next one to ensure, uh, <clears throat> to ensure openness of information on land ownership. First, to ensure that the following information about climate vulnerability is published as the open information, uh, information about the quality, availability, and scarcity of the city water, information on the use of agriculture methods and crop varieties, reducing extreme temperature, rain, and pieces, uh, information on the population access of early warming systems about disease uh, and extreme weather events. And uh, Uzbekistan is an agricultural country. That's why information on the scope of agricultural land protection of uh, fertility restoration programs. The, the last one to ensure public information about the real-time healthcare system capacity. These recommendations is very, will be, would be very useful for the country. Um, I hope these recommendations will be um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, during this first round of some kind of uh, ask and questions session, so we we very much focused on the government on particular some kind of uh, the need for improvement of legislation and improve the access to particular types of data. Uh, but now I would love to uh, talk about other stakeholders as well. We saw that. Uh, even, uh, for example, in previous times, uh, much focus for, was on availability of data when we have been assessing access to open data in, uh, in particular countries. But uh, now, since we are talking about how this uh, access to availability of, of data can, could have on 
well-being of citizens and what kind of benefits open data could generate uh, for, uh, for public, uh, we, need, we see that there is need for engagement of other stakeholders in uh, using data as well. So in this case, um, what kind of role you see um, for different stakeholders, not only about, uh, and I'm uh, talking about not only about civil society organizations, but also media, academia, and the private sector as well. And uh, from your understanding, are they somehow engaged in these open data initiatives? And, and if not, what should be done? How to motivate them to engage in this some kind of domain? And uh, yeah, maybe Alpine, you can start because you'll be as the first uh, and afterwards our colleagues will join. Thank you, Teona. Uh, it's a very important question. Uh, we can't blame just the governments for, uh, uh, for all the drawbacks in open data because uh, other entities like academia, research institutions, uh, CSOs, they are not only the users of information, but also they generate information. So in this term, the collaboration between government and, uh, and other organizations is, is crucial to include like all the needs from different stakeholders uh, to address all the requirements and uh, to generate something uh, together. And I guess like methodologies like uh, of design thinking uh, and other innovative methodologies that can bring together and um, uh, make the stakeholders to ideate together uh, will bring better outcomes because uh, the structure and the content will be more tailored to the, to the needs of different stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe Iqbal would love to say something on this. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, I agree, it's quite important point. Uh, but there is uh, a little bit difficulty because in academia and specifically in, uh, journalists, they typically have direct connection with the public organizations. If there is a will from the public organizations, they can get data without opening it to public. So in this regard, uh, public do not have uh, information about that data because it is going from a certain organization to a certain researcher and they research that data and publish research results. So this is not open data per se. Of course, it is contributing to the landscape. It adds value, but it is not considered open data. Uh, this is uh, more about the uh, willingness of government organization to share data. And this is also culturally accepted, if it is culturally accepted to, to give that kind of data sets. Of course, uh, the principles of data, go, uh, data uh, open data uh, says that uh, if you want for public organizations, if you want to reduce the number of requests, you need to open it and then people will take it from there. However, it does not work this way because uh, either because uh, e-government systems typically do not consider open data as a click of button to share data. It's extra work for public organizations. There is no demand. If you publish it, nothing happens. When you go to centralized open data portal, you see that a certain data set has not been downloaded. Uh, this demotivates government organization to do this kind of circles. However, if there is a will and if there is direct communication, and which we see in many uh, universities or academia, they directly approach the government organization and take data. So, uh, of course, we, we would like to have this kind of data sets in open data portal, and uh, we would like to see the research related to a certain uh, open data uh, to be linked. It's not only about data, but it is also about stories behind of that data, uh, but it does not work in this way. Uh, in many cases, it's individual communication. It goes out of open data ecosystem. Yeah, thank you, Iqbal. And actually your comment reminded me one case regarding Georgia when uh, uh, back in 2019, actually, 
Georgia started to somehow uh, publish data on assets declarations of public officials. Actually, one of the motivators, apart from existence of political will to uh, publish such data in order to somehow deal with corruption, uh, what, uh, one of um, one of the motivators for public institutions was to see how much time they would somehow save uh, because uh, lots of media organizations have been requesting this data, I mean, assets declarations of public officials. And we even made a study on this, how much time they have been uh, somehow um, wasting for uh, somehow uh, providing these assets declarations to journalists. And afterwards, actually, once this portal was uh, published and uh, publicly available for everyone, the number of requests they have been received, I and mean, this public institution, which was in charge of this asset declaration, was dramatically decreased. So this is very interesting, some kind of case when the two, some kind of uh, components, I mean, the will, political existence of political will, at the same time, some kind of uh, motivation, of course, uh, from the private sector to resolve the, uh, some kind of bureaucratic um, procedures or uh, challenges are uh, intervene and it comes out as a, some kind of positive development for other uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, and even though nowadays we have this challenge that this data is not open in uh, fully or in open formats, and it's another stage for us to advocate uh, for the disclosure of this data in open formats. Yeah, and now with this, I would love to ask um, uh, David as well, if maybe you would love to comment on this about different stakeholders. Uh, yes, uh, sure. So um, in Georgia at this moment, it is very apparent that um, the main stakeholder involved in using and uh, reusing open data is the civil society sector and uh, uh, some think tanks. Um, but there has been limited evidence of um, the media using uh, open data. Um, I believe this is uh, a direct result of some capacity building activities that uh, have been implementing, implemented by, uh, again, civil society organizations and to some extent, they have been successful since uh, since they have increased uh, some uh, some activity from uh, from media sector. Uh, I believe this type of uh, trainings and this type of capacity uh, building activities could also be implemented for other stakeholders, such as academia, for example, uh, maybe uh, some. Uh, some universities could uh, integrate these short uh, capacity building trainings into their curriculum, um, uh, maybe for uh, private sectors as well. Uh, also, another uh, very important um, uh, factor that has boosted the use of use and impact of open data in, in Georgia is um, the um, existence of uh, third party portals that uh, convert some uh, government uh, available data into open data to make them more accessible and more processable by uh, by less equipped uh, stakeholders. Uh, in this case, the media, for example, uh, we have several uh, several cases of this in Georgia. Uh, the uh, the party financing data is available through a third party portal, for example, uh, as well as um, uh, the budget, some of the budget data is available through a similar portal. Uh, and these type of portals uh, are shown to significantly boost the use and the impact of, uh, of these categories of data. Uh, so these are definitely some things to consider and maybe also export and, uh, and uh, implement it in other countries. Uh, thank you, David. And maybe Rustam also wants to comment on this because I know that he already somehow highlighted this aspect during his presentation, uh, how this some kind of there's no significant uh, activities from other stakeholders, but still, uh, how do you think uh, how we could motivate uh, uh, these other stakeholders and who could motivate them? Yeah, if you have any thoughts on this. 
Um, I'll be just very short, uh, very brief comment. Yes, the country has a very diff difficult political situation. Um, but I would say that one of the striking things about Turkmenistan is that there is in general a very little discussion when it comes to open data policies. And I think one of the major reasons is because there is a very little awareness in the population in general and among various stakeholders of um, how and um, why it is important to have certain data publicly available and how um, this kind of data could actually benefit the country's development and in general, uh, say, state society relations and etc. Um, so um, inside of the country, again, we don't see that um, academia or our research institutions um, sort of analyze and focus um, on these kind of developments and issues. And this actually, in a way, also reflects the general trend when it comes to Central Asia. There are not that many um, academic articles so, uh, that focus on open data policies and the benefits of open data policies. This is just an emerging strand of academic literature, so to say. Um, at the same time, we do have certain um, civil society institutions, human rights watchdogs from outside of the country that are actually using open data sources of the countries that they are based in um, in order to reveal the certain corrupted, corrupting practices of um, our government, such as one of our organizations was actually using UK company registers to identify certain companies linked to our political elites. So we see that there is in general demand and we see how the civil society would want to do it. And they see the benefits and the importance of this in identifying this kind of corruptive practices. And I think this is one of the main reasons why our government still holds um, a very tight grip when it comes to the information and holds um, the monopoly. Um, so again, um, uh, when it comes to the different stakeholders, um, our great hopes come to all these kind of um, academia representatives, uh, civil society institutions, media organizations from outside the country that can actually uh, push either the government directly or through an engagement with um, similar kinds of um, organizations, think tanks and international institutions to encourage and urge Turkmen authorities to start making steps to at least make certain data publicly available. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Juliet, would you love to comment on this as well? Okay, uh, so in this case, actually, I just want it as a, some kind of uh, uh, for the final. Hello? Yes. Uh, Hello? Yes. yes, we hear, yes, we hear I you now. Some, yeah, uh, yeah. I have something to say about open data. Uh, as I mentioned about Uzbekistan scores is very really high initiative of open data. But problem is that in, um, in Uzbekistan, uh, the classification and control of the open data isn't good. And there is a lack of open data processing organization and scientific research institution is the problem of Pakistan. And you, Tiona, you mentioned uh, the importance of open data and the fight against the corruption. And it, this is a very important for Uzbekistan at the moment. Because, uh, <clears throat> because, uh, in Uzbekistan, corrupt, uh, it's, uh, Uzbekistan's, uh, the, the level of corruption is very high, you know. Uzbekistan is the 140 least corrupt nations out of 180 countries, according to the 2021 Corruption Reception Index. That's why uh, this, this problem is very actual in Uzbekistan right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you, you highlighted a very important somehow aspect of access to open data to somehow deal with uh, corruption. And of course, as we also mentioned previously, uh, some of the countries lack these tools uh, uh, for government oversight, uh, which, come, uh, which are coming from open data initiatives and yeah, Uzbekistan could be one of them. And in this case, maybe local stakeholders could somehow have some joint efforts uh, in this direction. Uh, and uh, so with this, I would love to just um, ask our uh, panelists to make some kind of final comments 
how do you think how could we use uh, GDB results for our advocacy efforts? I mean, uh, do do you think do you see some kind of potential in uh, local advocacy efforts with the use of GDP results and uh, how would you somehow uh, envisage such kind of initiatives should we focus so uh, not we but you as uh, some kind of uh, national researchers you know the uh, local context uh, better uh, uh, would you recommend to have some kind of uh, what kind of uh, topics to uh, to focus on when uh, when we are talking about some advocacy efforts or maybe capacity building act activities on the local level and how we could so bet better uh, use the GDB results in this. Yes, Arpina, you can okay, start. I guess I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so of course it's more difficult when it comes to action than just recommendations. Um, in terms of actions, I think um, we can contribute more if we um, if we act as a part of some institution who is uh, active uh, in the field connected to data, and I guess like every field now, nowadays is connected to, somehow is connected to data and uh, is using or uh, contributing to data. And what, what I can see from my perspective and uh, from the perspective of um, SDG uh, Innovation uh, Lab, uh, the part of which uh, I am as a researcher, uh, because our, our one of the service lines uh, of the SDG Innovation Lab is uh, digitalization. Uh, this exercise uh, helped us to see the red flags, the red areas where uh, Armenia is uh, lacking digitalized services and uh, digital data, where, where there is data, there is information, but it is not available in uh, open data format. Um, so for us, uh, those areas will become priority and we can work on it. And now we have like evidence to show to the uh, to government that uh, based on the results of uh, Global Data Barometer, uh, these areas were identified and we have the evidence behind this to prioritize these uh, areas. Thank you very much. It's a very good strategy from your side. Uh, and yeah, I think you can definitely use uh, this and you will contribute not only this SDG uh, implementation process also, and also in general, the access to open data will be improved in the country. So, and Iqbal, do you have any, some kind of reflections on this? Few days ago, I was discussing about uh, land data with the uh, Minister of Property, actual Committee of Property of Azerbaijan. And uh, actually, they collect this data and opening it is not a big problem. So, uh, but unfortunately, till now, there were no such kind of initiative. And this is one of the uh, reasons that Azerbaijan got a little bit below than average score uh, comparing to other countries. What I want to say, there are two things. Some data sets are very sensitive data sets, but others are impactful, but not very sensitive data sets. At least uh, we can get those impactful data sets without too much political consequences open and get them to be used, like land data, which is not very much impacting to the political landscape. That's why it is possible to open it in a proper way. And another one is procurement data. If uh, uh, these kind of data sets are opened, uh, I'm pretty sure that Azerbaijan can get quite good score because other the landscape is there, we need to have a little bit more open data sets uh, in terms of the methodology demands to us to, to get them open. So uh, after this stage, I guess the most important uh, steps is to get them to be open and uh, to get them to be used. Uh, I mean, not all of them, of course, it would be uh, not realistic to target everything and try to get all of them at once. But few data sets that impact the result a bit more than others can be open. And uh, the digitalization level allows us to open it very quickly and maintain it in a certain way, specifically in the centralized open data portal. So uh, I, my approach is to uh, share this result with uh, the government organizations and to make sure that they know exactly what has the reason 
for getting this low score. Uh, if we know that exactly what was the reason, then we can target them and then we can make them a little bit better. So uh, I am pretty sure that many data sets specifically about spending data, budgeting, uh, these kind of politically important data sets wouldn't be very easily shared, but others can easily share without any uh, problem. Thank you very much, Iqbal. And I see Sylvana's comment in the chat. Uh, she shared uh, this um, land uh, portal and the uh, guide, uh, which could uh, help you in this process and you can uh, check it later. Uh, yes, and uh, David, would you love to comment on some kind of potential next steps in Georgia? Uh, yes, so um, GDB's methodology has done uh, a good job at uh, highlighting the, uh, the areas where most challenges are concentrated. And uh, as already mentioned, it is a very good tool for, uh, for assessing it as a, as a benchmark and to be used as a benchmark, uh, especially in the coming years, if uh, there are more editions of GDB released, but also in comparison to the open uh, data barometer, uh, the previous editions, um, uh, which are not uh, exactly similar, but uh, still some parallels can be, um, can be drawn and some, um, some deductions can be made of, uh, about the development in, uh, in, in each country. Um, so, um, I, I know that the results are not meant to be compared between the countries, but um, some, some scores uh, in some modules were surprising even to us. Uh, and uh, it highlighted the, uh, the, the challenges and the, uh, the, the pace at which uh, some countries are lagging behind in terms of uh, if we compare them to other countries in the region. And uh, this knowledge, uh, I believe, could be uh, used to um, influence some decision makers and uh, to really uh, demonstrate to them the need for, uh, for change and to direct efforts in the right directions where, where most challenges are concentrated. Uh, thank you, David. And actually, from IDFI side, I can add that uh, we actually plan to have some kind of um, analysis of um, the results for Georgia and what are the gaps actually. The similar what it will also, also mentioned with regard to Azerbaijan and um, maybe late at a later stage, we could have some kind of more face-to-face uh, -face discussion with decision makers as well, uh, how they could improve and maybe there, there will be some kind of political will from the side. Sometimes actually there is will, but they don't know that this uh, availability of particular data will, will somehow improve uh, the performance of, of uh, country in any direction. So in this case, we will try also in Georgia. And yeah, I think that uh, GDB will uh, be a very somehow important tool for this in this direction. And also we uh, have the information that the government of Georgia plans to adopt open data standards in the future. Uh, and uh, of course, we will use uh, GDB, some kind of methodology and these international, international standards uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, and uh, I see some kind of comments uh, in the chat from Armenia. And I think um, I would highlight here that once we will uh, done, uh, we are done with a final comment from our uh, researchers. Uh, we will have some time for uh, open some kind of discussion with the participation of speakers, and maybe later you can also share your thoughts, um, uh, not only in chat, but uh, you can voice, uh, you can share your thoughts directly. Uh, and with this, I would love to ask Rustam, maybe you would love to share some kind of finer thoughts, how we could use GDB in our advocacy. Um, yeah, it's very hard to add something more because I think you guys did a really great job summing up in general the ways that the GDB can be used. And I totally agree with all the points. 
uh, particular when it comes to Turkmenistan. I'm repeating myself uh, because of the political environment. There are de definitely certain areas which the government considers sensitive and it would be very difficult to expect um, that it would make some radical steps toward opening up um, certain data. But then again, there are certain areas which are not politically sensitive um, and there are ways to sort of encourage and urge the government to open certain data that can be actually very beneficial and i think gdb can use as one of the important tools in this regard it can be used by international organizations by other let's call them um, non-partisan or bipartisan sort of organizations uh, which can um, actually convince uh, the government and the government can learn from all these best practices and standards that are used um, even on sort of post-Soviet space in Central Asian countries and um, neighboring regions and some of these practices they can adopt. And one other way, I think JDB can also become a very important tool when it comes to academia um, as well and uh, sort of maybe if it's not going to be overly focused, but at least one of those starting points um, to have a much um, to expand this academic debates on open data policies, the existing challenges, gaps, and the ways that we can improve them and move forward. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The role of international actors is also very relevant for Georgia as well, and I'm, I'm sure it's relevant for other countries in our region. Uh, and uh, Huriet, would you love to share your thoughts on this as well? Yes. The importance and the significance of the GDP, uh, GDP results is very really, really great. Uh, I think every country is my, must understand this because the results obtained from GDP will help to understand the real nature of important problems in the countries, such as developing the delays and emerging corruption. Without GDP information, it was impossible to realize the root cases of uh, corruption in the country for, for Uzbekistan example. I want to, to example. Based on the GDP results, I, uh, I identified the following on the state of corruption in the countries. First of all, line between political and business remains blurred in Uzbekistan. Inadequate control of political finance because no information is uh, for this uh, case. Opic lobbying, no legislative act for lobbying registry in Uzbekistan. And third one, beneficial ownership, no legislative act for this purpose. Make cause of high corruption in the country. And uh, this is not only for Uzbekistan, this problem is not only for Uzbekistan. Uh, Central Asian, Asian countries also is the same situation. I uh, analyzed some parts. That's why uh, GDP results, um, Actually, is a very important, and uh, I want to thank especially for founders for the thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Huriet. And now uh, I would love to just open our discussion for other participants as well. You are welcome to uh, somehow share your thoughts um, on some kind of on everything, on GDP results, on particular countries or your some kind of suggestions as well, especially on some kind of potential uh, local advocacy efforts, which could be somehow uh, held by others uh, as, uh, uh, and also other stakeholders as well. And uh, yeah, if, if you raise hand, uh, our some kind of uh, technical supporters will allow you uh, to share your thoughts or you can just uh, share via, via chat as well if you uh, find it more comfortable. Uh, I think it was um, Lili Afrikian who uh, shared some kind of information in the chat, but Lilia, if you would love to share some thoughts on this particular issue, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, somehow uh, share your experience um, and use mic for this, if you would love to. Yes, I think Lilia would love to share and comment something and yeah. Are you allowed to, to speak now? Uh, 
I think she needs to be promoted to panelists to be able to speak. Yeah, I think my colleague was dealing with this and hope there's no technical problem on this. Uh, while we're dealing with a technical problem, maybe I can echo to Lilia's comment. Yes. Uh, and I'd like to ensure Lilia that the information on beneficial ownership uh, processes is reflected in the survey uh, covering the area of mining, which was uh, the area covered uh, during the survey period. Um, hello to everyone. Hearing me? Yes, we hear you yes, very well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting discussion and information on data availability in our region. Um, I'm Lilia, I'm an Open Government Partnership Initiatives Coordinator in Armenia. Mm -hmm. And mainly as in other countries, also in Armenia, uh, the action plans of uh, OGP mostly related to the data and to the open data. Um, most of tools that providing data and contains open data uh, context uh, that presented by uh, Artimaginia uh, um, has been developed within Open Government Partnership National Action Plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to note that um, the just, uh, uh, legislative adjustments that absence in Armenia um, do not regulate these uh, gaps between practical actions related to digitalization and also uh, the other relations related to the state and the public or citizens. So um, uh, these days government is actively working on the new national action plan, which is copying the development of data policy structure in covering um, development of existing and the new data that could be uh, used and developed within the state administration and also, also private sector. And within this um, uh, 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 data policy structure, we are going also to design or identify some uh, legal regulations that could adjust uh, uh, some um, um, relations of state administration and agencies and also citizens. It mostly really related to the personal data, to the secret data, big data, or uh, also uh, related to the open data. I think it's very important during these unprecedented times to have some regulations. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, when we are uh, when we were collecting uh, the proposals to the new national action plan, some our colleagues from civil society organizations or international organizations asking to open uh, to provide more open data from a state register from. Um, um, other register related to the taxes and uh, uh, health or education system. But uh, we decided to mobilize all our efforts and firstly develop national uh, 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 policy paper, which could regulate all these issues. And um, I think um, after these regulations, it would be more easier to describe uh, your citizens or partners why you can provide this information on open data format freely or why this or that uh, information depends on costs. Um, uh, uh, also within this, uh, we are designing some um, commitments which also could um, contain some data disclosure, but uh, we are going to um, to uh, to design it just after the development of this policy paper. This is what we are going on just uh, actively in Armenia and um, hope that next year or in the upcoming years, we could bring some uh, updated and uh, new, uh, uh, new quality data. Yeah. To this, uh, for this discussion. Thank you. 
thank you very much. And uh, I think that you could use GDB, some kind of methodology as a best practice, uh, what uh, some kind of standards you could consider as a, some kind of international standards in this uh, direction. Uh, thank you very much. And now, if other some uh, our uh, participants and our audience would love to comment on any of the uh, of any of the of the topics uh, highlighted today, or maybe you have some information uh, to sh uh, to share with us. If you have any information to share with us, uh, please free to share before we uh, finish uh, today's event. Is there any some kind of volunteer? If not, actually, um, from my side, thank you very much for your participation and very uh, somehow very interesting actually thoughts from all our participants and also some reflections from our and questions of of course from our. Uh, audience and maybe um, I would love to ask Silvana and Georgi. Maybe you would love to make some final comments, and we can say goodbye afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Tiona. Uh, no, basically, what I want to say is thank you to all of you, the national researchers. Uh, Tiona as a coordinator, Georgi from uh, IDFI. I mean, I think it, this was a great conversation. I learned. I mean, even more about the, the region and the differences that could be done there. Uh, so hopefully there are many more things to do in the future. And, uh, and of course, you have the support of the GDB team to help you or assist you in anything that you think uh, we can be of use. And again, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a great way to, to start this day here in, in Argentina. Uh, thank you. And uh, actually, I, I think that uh, as ID, for IDFI, uh, which works on access to open data since uh, 2009, actually, this is a very great tool uh, now to somehow start our, not start, but actually continue our, our advocacy for more access to public data. That uh, it just somehow gives us this structure and also gives us overview of existing tendencies regarding particular some kind of sectoral data, data as well. Uh, and if our if our uh, panelists would love to share some final words, otherwise I think we can finish with the event and thank you once again, everyone for participating. Thank you so much. For coordinating. Thanks for cooperation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. your great work, actually. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Without a lot you. for organizing. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Take care. Hope to see you again. Thank you very much for our organization. Bye.